There are two types of potential energy we're going to explore today in this video. The first will be gravitational potential energy. And the second is elastic potential energy. But what is potential energy? What does this term actually mean? So we could define potential energy as the stored energy an object has because of its position relative to other objects, its current shape or its state. Now this is a rather vague description. So we're going to break this down with a few examples. If you had a coffee cup in your hand, and let's say this coffee cup was one meter above the floor, this coffee cup here has potential energy. In other words, this energy has the potential to be converted into other forms of energy. For example, kinetic energy. And remember, kinetic energy it's the form of energy an object has when it's in motion. In other words, when it has a velocity. And the formula for kinetic energy is half times the mass of the object times the velocity of the object squared. Now, if you hold this coffee cup still above the ground, so this coffee cup isn't moving, the cup's kinetic energy in this situation is zero. It doesn't have any kinetic energy. But the cup does have gravitational potential energy in this situation. Now, if you want to convert this gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, you would drop the cup. And one thing you'll hear in physics class is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And this is a fundamental principle of energy conservation. This means that when we drop our cup, all its gravitational potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. This gravitational potential energy isn't disappearing, it's simply being transformed into kinetic energy. So as the cup is falling, its gravitational potential energy decreases, but at the same time, this kinetic energy increases by the same amount. And we know this because as the cup is falling, its velocity is increasing. If its velocity is increasing here, this means that its kinetic energy is also increasing. So gravitational potential energy can be determined with this equation where the gravitational potential energy is equal to the object's mass times the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by the height the object is above some zero point and in this case this zero point is the ground here So the SI unit for potential energy is the joule, and it's the same as kinetic energy. And we want to remember here that this equation only works when our free fall acceleration, this g here, is constant over the height that the object is falling. So if our coffee cup has a mass, of 100 grams, which is 0 0.100 kilograms. We've dropped it from a height of 1.5 meters now. So our height is 1.50 meters. What is the gravitational potential energy of this cup just before we drop it? Well, if we use this formula here, the gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass of the cup, 0 0.100 kilograms, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which on the Earth's surface is 9.81 meters per second squared. And we multiply it by the height above the floor, which is 1.5 meters. So 
So multiplying this all together, we get a gravitational potential energy of 1.47 joules. Now what can we do with this value? Well, with this value, we can work out the velocity of the cup as it hits the ground. And we can do this because of the principle of energy conservation. The gravitational potential energy that we worked out, the 1.47 joules, is going to be converted into kinetic energy here. So if all the gravitational potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy, then we know that the final kinetic energy as it hits the floor is also going to be 1.47 joules. Now in reality it's not going to be exactly 1.47 joules but I'll explain why this is in a minute. So if we know the kinetic energy, we know the mass of the cup, all we need to find out now is the velocity of the cup. How can we do this? Well we simply rearrange this kinetic energy equation to make the velocity the subject of the formula. So kinetic energy is equal to half times the mass times velocity squared. We already have the kinetic energy. It's 1.47 joules as the cup strikes the ground. We know the mass of the cup. 0 0.100 kilograms and we're here to work out the velocity so we multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this half and we divide both sides of the equation by 0 0.1 kilograms and because our velocity is squared here we square root both sides of the equation square root and that will equal our velocity so when we sum this up together, we get a velocity of 5.42 meters per second. Now, why do you think this velocity is not going to be entirely accurate here? In other words, when the cup hits the ground, the velocity is going to be slightly less than 5.42 meters per second. Why do you think this is? If this cup is dropped in an atmosphere, then this cup will experience air resistance. In other words, it will have to spend its kinetic energy, some of its kinetic energy, pushing away gas molecules as it falls through the air. So its kinetic energy, when it reaches the ground, will be ever so slightly less than the gravitational potential energy. And if you need a refresher on drag forces and terminal velocity, I have a video up in the card. So our cup is now resting on the floor. So does this mean that this cup has zero gravitational potential energy now? Well, this depends. We've defined our height of our floor to be at some zero level. And this zero level here, this zero point, is the vertical coordinate at which gravitational potential energy is defined to be zero. And this was our choice to make in this situation. But what if we're standing in a room on a second floor of a building? Then our cup here resting on the floor can still contain gravitational potential energy because if we drop our cup out of the window here, more gravitational potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy as it falls to the ground below. So this floor here will no longer be the zero point or the zero level. What about elastic potential energy? Imagine we have a block that is attached to a spring on a tabletop here. If we apply a pushing force to this block, we start to compress this spring here.
as we compress this spring, we're storing elastic potential energy in this spring. The same will be true if we stretch this string beyond this equilibrium point. In both cases, we're storing elastic potential energy in this string. In both situations, if we take away this force, then the elastic potential energy stored in the string will be converted into kinetic energy as the block gets accelerated back towards the equilibrium position. And if we have no friction between the block and the table, and we consider air resistance to be really small here, then all the spring's elastic potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy. And this relates back to our conservation of energy principle. So elastic potential energy can be determined with the following equation. The elastic potential energy is equal to one half multiplied by the spring constant, and you may have heard this as the force constant, multiplied by the distance the string has been compressed or stretched, and this is squared. So the spring constant here gives us an idea of how much effort is needed to compress or stretch this spring. A large spring constant means the spring is very stiff. So think of the springs on a car suspension. A small spring constant represents a spring that is more flexible and one that is far easier to stretch and compress. So let's try an example problem here. Imagine we have a spring with a force constant or a spring constant of 10.2 newtons per meter. And this relaxed length here, when no forces are acting on the spring, is 1.5 meters. If I attach a mass to this spring now, I'm stretching the spring, which means I'm storing elastic potential energy in this spring here. So let's say this mass extends this spring by a length of 3.50 meters. What is the elastic potential energy stored in this string now? How can we work this out? Well, our value of x here is the difference between the sizes of the relaxed string and the string in its stretched position. So our value of x is going to be the difference between these two distances here. So x is going to equal 3.50 meters minus 1.50 meters or 2.00 meters. We know the spring constant and that's 10.2 newtons per meter. So we simply plug in these values to our equation up here. The elastic potential energy is equal to one half multiplied by 10.2 newtons per meter, multiplied by two meters squared. And when we sum up these values together, we get an elastic potential energy stored in this spring of 20.4 joules.